The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey there, welcome to the Bronx Buzz. This is Bronx Nets program where we talk to reporters and editors and writers and videographers and uh, filmmakers, anybody who puts stuff out in the Bronx. In our second section today, we're going to talk to one of my friends and colleagues who has a not-for-profit. He's a talk show host on BronxNet television, and um, he's got something really uh, special that he does in our neighborhoods, and we're going to talk to him about that. But we're going to start off with a, a reporter over there at The City, and it is uh, Katie Honan, who has not been with us before, but I'm thrilled to say um, good evening. Nice to have you with us, Katie. Thanks for having me on. I, I, I'm going to tell you in public what I told you um, prior to the show. I thought that your reporting on um, the city's, um, uh, for want of a better term, fudging the numbers or putting out numbers that weren't perfectly accurate on time when it comes to uh, COVID infections. Um, I, I thought that was um, landmark reporting on your part. Um, we know that uh, Governor Cuomo uh, was accused of something similar with uh, senior citizen um, centers. And, um, you know, so I just thought you did a great job with that. Um, you did couch it a little bit off camera. So let's <laughs> talk a little bit about what actually happened. Now, this was at the beginning of December. And so we'll rewind the clock a little bit. What happened with the reporting of the city's numbers and the mayor? <laughs> yeah, I can even rewind it back further. So um, to the peak of COVID, not that we want to remember exactly that, but in March and April, as reporters, and, and I was, I really went after the mayor for this, just getting as much data as possible. And I would ask, like, why don't we have this information? You need to have it broken down, whether it's by borough, by zip code, cases, and then deaths. We knew the deaths were happening and we didn't know where. Um, so then the, the zip code da uh, map of deaths was released in mid-May. And, you know, it, it seemed like a long time and other municipalities had released it earlier. And earlier this fall, uh, someone, you know, a source thankfully reached out to me and gave me internal emails that would not have been available to me as a reporter, even under the city's freedom, of, the state's Freedom of Information Act law, because it was in between people from the city's health department, but leaked to me emails and, and other documents that showed that this information, particularly on the deaths and where people were dying, was available in April, uh, the first week of April. And for whatever reason, City Hall just delayed, delayed, delayed. They, you know? they delayed it. Now, did they ultimately release, I hate to even ask, truthful numbers? Or did you feel like um, it was, um, you know, kind of deliberately held back for one reason or another? No, the numbers they released, from what I can tell, are were truthful. It was just the time that lapsed. And mm -hmm. it was concerning to people within the health department because they felt like, look, if you knew where the deaths were occurring, it might make you realize how dangerous this was. And there was other messaging, in, uh, for example, people within the health department who usually had been front facing to smaller doctors and, and community health centers were no longer allowed to speak to them. So when it came to really vital messaging to the public about what was going on, everything was filtered through City Hall. Whether you want to attribute that to Mayor Bill de Blasio's micromanagement, and we all were aware there was lots of reporting of how he moved responsibilities from the health department to the city's health and hospitals corporation. It was just a lot of internal strife between the agencies at a time when the city was in a very, very crucial moment, truly life or death, of what was going on. And we weren't getting any there, from the there, there, there was There's one piece that you did not mention. I mean, you said you, we want to know where the deaths are. The re, Now, this goes back to the, the fundamental CompStat theory that goes back to, of course, the Giuliani days. The reason that we want to know where the deaths are is because that's where resources need to be put immediately. And one of the things you identified quite correctly is we know what happened to our most vulnerable communities, uh, you know, in April of 2020. And if a spike was going to be, especially in some of those neighborhoods, that's where we want. And we don't want it two weeks late because, you know, you could, if, if there's a problem there with either resource or access or vaccinations or whatever it is. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a health professional to know what you need to do in exactly in those spaces. Yeah. 
um, that that's why you need it. That's why even the the delay, if the information was there, make it public, and also it would let people in the neighborhood know. People in Mod Haven, for example, yeah. would say, "Wait a minute, we've got a spike here." Immediately, those local officials, the community board, residents could stay safe. So, to me, I, I really appreciated your reporting. That's I, my. Like no, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the people reaching out to me because we as reporters can only get, I always imagine it's like an iceberg, you know, we see just this much and we could try and try and try, but we rely on people on the inside, city workers who have this information. So that's why I always try to encourage dialogue with the people while also letting them know, I'm not going to gen you up, you know, confidentiality and that kind of thing. But oh, of it, course. Yeah, it, it is. It really is like a trust you're trying to build with the people who have this information because that was a time it was every single day was so stressful trying to figure out what was going on. Right. To know that you had it and just sat on it. Really I'll put it. I'll put it in a colloquial Bronx phrase. Tell it if you got it. Tell it. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> know. I think. I uh, listen, I I, I want to know, and I'm going to reporter to reporter ask you. Um, were you picking a little bit at the mayor by saying, "Well, the mayor closed um, twenty uh, COVID." testing centers and then you know a couple of days later he was like hey wait a minute ladies and gentlemen we gotta you know, we need more testing out there um you know was it like that or was it really like well he flip-flopped in a way seemed to me the timing was such that he didn't fully know that he was going to need more testing at the time that he closed the, <laughs> those no terms. yeah and you know my colleagues at the city wrote that they use data that they had kept on hand to see previous sites to figure out exactly right. when we were closed. But that just came from noticing an uptick. And and I think, yeah, uh, you know, they, the mayor closed those and other health officials, they closed them when there wasn't a demand. But perhaps someone in the greatest city in the world should have noticed an uptick. Of uh, right. Should have should have been watching, you know, CNN to see the president warning about right. Omicron at the time. Yeah. And then, of course, assuming now, I, I mean, this goes back to something way back when I remember that the original numbers in the Bronx for COVID infections and we're talking about, you know, late March 2020 showed the Bronx to kind of be doing better. And I said, nah, uh, you, I know where it's going to hit yeah. and I know where we don't have the resources. And of course, it was only a matter of time before those numbers uh, flipped around. Um, so maybe it's a, the, the same kind of thing. Um, and now um, th there's a, a tremendous crush about testing. Uh, I, I have a, um, a somebody close to me who um, was not feeling well and waited online in Cobb City for like two and a half hours, maybe more yesterday. And then there were people who waited later and then were told that we don't have any tests left or we're closing in Dubai. Uh, this is like a problem. Uh, where are we at for um, uh, testing uh, right now? And there's the there's your long COVID test lines by um, Katie Honum. Yeah. And, and that was I think now this week it's getting a little bit better. There's more actual tests and there's more testing sites open. But yeah, I mean, what we saw in the previous two weeks, it was just a crush of people, whether they needed, A, you had Omicron surging. So people were trying to figure out what was going on. You had people who needed to travel, so they needed to get tests. So it was, everywhere I went, it was really, really long lines. There's a site opened by me at the Woodside Houses in Queens. The line has been wrapped around the building for, you know, two weeks now. Um, wow. And also that's because there's a there's fewer testing sites than there have been, you know, a month ago. So it's this combination of things. I, I have noticed those rapids that you get at Dwayne Reed that have been sold out last week. I saw a bunch at my Dwayne Reed yesterday. The city was doing giveaways. Um, but yeah, they're, they're just going through lots and lots of tests. I went to a site in Corona last week and, um, you know, the people couldn't open the boxes quick enough to to give out the tests to people. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that it. it in the perfect world, we'd like to have a van on every street corner, and then right. we could we could get there. Do you? Have, I don't know if you know this. Do you have a? And I don't know the answer to it. Do you have the sense that um, these are city resources providing um, these testing centers, or there is some support coming from the federal government on these things, or it the state a, even? But I I think yeah. you know the president has been talking a lot about funding these things. It's a combination. From what I've seen, it's primarily city run sites. But I know in Jackson Heights, Queens, there was a CDC bus. Um, so that was from the federal government. Um, the state was providing tests and the FET, like the, the at-home rapids and, and the federal government. But yeah, most of the, the sites, if you're looking for a site, if it's if it's a publicly run site, so it's not one of these private PCR tests that can cost, you know, $300 for right. in a couple hours. It is run by the city with support from the state. But yeah, there's a, I saw there's like a little CDC 
van at Travers Park in Jackson Heights, Queens, and, and I'm sure if you yeah, we, we we need thirty of those, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's start there. Thirty of those in a part of Queens. I mean, that's yeah, the yeah. numbers of people uh, you know who could potentially be affected. Um, almost out of time. I want to talk uh, one last thing about. Um, mandates and closing and the, uh, a recent thing that came out that was very surprising. Uh, I believe it was the CDC said that health employees don't have to uh, quarantine for wh whatever the number was, 10, 10 days, yeah. seven days. Um, and yet now uh, you wrote a story about city employees calling for uh, remote work options uh, as uh, the virus spreads. Um, where, where are we at? And nobody wants to close down again. Right. But, um, you know, um, symp sympathy for the workers, of course, a worker says, look, I'm ready to keep working. We did it a, a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, I don't want to ride the subway, at least yeah. right now. Um, so wh what do you think? Where are we at as far as all that? Uh, that whole yeah, thing goes? I think it as it pertains to city workers and it's from mo most of the city workers I speak to who are office workers. I don't mean teachers or police officers or firefighters who are they can't do their jobs remotely. I mean, teachers can, we've seen that, but a lot of office workers within city agencies, they adapted and they worked remotely at the, you know, in 2020. And in a lot of ways, they said they were much more productive, maybe because they had to be because of the emergency situation we were in, but um, there is no telework option. And I think what con what concerns them is there's no flexibility at all. And but but I have to interject. There was a, a, a year and a half ago, right? I mean, nobody yeah. could come to work, and the city the city didn't shut down. I'm not saying that every worker, um, you know, was working remotely, but I guess they're scared of um, having it affect a, a, a trickle down, as it were, right. the, the lunch shops and the uh, yeah. people around city hall, and of course the buses and subways. You take those people off the trains, uh, all of a sudden, you know, there's, it affects other things. Yeah. And, and that's what the mayor says. And he says, in a way that insults many people, he says, oh, you just get more work done in person, uh, which kind of belittles the work they did. Oh, goodness, yeah, goodness, what goodness. they say is we, we want the option and they we, feel that they're being, they're like lab rats or they're just working to businesses over in, in lower Manhattan where- we, we, I have to interrupt you because we're running out of time, but we started this conversation with the mayor, but we have just seen in that conversation, they're both the good and the bad of uh, Bill de Blasio, is that, well, you know, we get it, but he said the wrong thing there, as far as I can tell. We're, anyway. we're all complex people, even the mayor, yeah. I guess. Figuring that um, out. Katie Honan, um, what a pleasure to have you on the program. Do you anticipate keep, um, you're going to keep uh, working on uh, Omicron and COVID, or um, the world is your oyster, so to speak? Yeah, I, I think COVID is a story that isn't going anywhere, even if hopefully our numbers go right. down and just the long-term effects on the city. It's it's a story that stayed with me, and I know it's stayed with our readers as well. So I will hope to keep re reporting on it. We hope you will. Katie Conan uh, from the city, thank you so much. And uh, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back from that break, as I said, one of my colleagues is going to be on the show. You think we can't talk? We can talk. Yeah, don't go away. <laughs> we'll be right back with the Bronx Buzz right after this. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. There's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people it's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality.
All right, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. And as I said earlier, I'm very excited. One of my colleagues is on the program. And uh, the reason he is on the program is because he has a wonderful charity. You know him as Dr. Bob Lee from WBLS. You know him as Dr. Bob Lee from Open Monday. But the fact is, he is the president and CEO of Make the Grade. And that's what we're going to talk about with my buddy Bob. How are you, sir? Good, good. Nice to see you, Gary. Always a pleasure. It's always great. And, it, you know, we, we, we've we talked about this before, that we work in the same place. We work for the same place. Of course, now we're in, in our, you know, personal locations, but we never get to see each other. So this is a nice way for us to say hello anyway and see what's going on. Um, but really, Make the Great is exciting. Um, I heard about it and I said, you know what, we got we to give them a pump. We got to put them on TV. Um, tell me about what Make the Great is, when it got started, and uh, what you're doing for our kids for the kids of the Bronx and the kids of the city of New York. Make the great, uh, the make the great foundation is a collaboration between parent, teacher, student, community, clergy, financial literacy, and health. And uh, we did it based upon, we started it based upon what we've been doing for many years um, with uh, the WBLS on time program. What we did was go around to schools throughout the tri-state area, encouraging students to stay in school and be on time and get a good education. So in visiting those schools, I said, you know what? There's something more that's needed. And I wanted to start this foundation for many years in, in 2004, the end of 2004. I said, ah, I got it. We'll call it the Bob Lee Foundation. Or, And I didn't, I wanted to have a name that was more meaningful. Oh, come on. The Bob Lee Foundation is meaningful to many of us. But I understand what you're saying. You wanted it to, to mean something. Well, the way you just described it, you know, we hear the phrase that it takes a village. Yeah, exactly. And we hear that all the time. You actually have put that in place so that you're proving in order to help our kids do better, uh, then we need all those people and all those uh, resources that you lift, you listed. Right? Yeah. Nail on the head. And that was the idea behind it. You know, um, when I came up to make the grade foundation for education, not just to um, honor somebody or applaud someone who is receiving B's and A's, but uh, to give accolades to people who are bringing the grade up, who are making the grade coming, bring it up to the next level. And yes, um, that was the idea. It takes a village to raise a family. So that's how we came up with the uh, and so give me some activities that you do, like the best of them. Um, I know that Rebecca has some video we're going to show as well. We're going to, there's a real cute video of you with the kids, but um, talk to me about like, what's the best of it? And, and what do you see? The re I know you in 17 years, you see the results. Talk to me about what, what's going on that really is exciting. Yeah, we have a number of things that we're very proud of. We partner with a lot of other organizations. Also, we have the college bus tour. Uh, we have the college gathering where people get in and find out what college is all about, you know, um, and they do that once or twice, or three times a year. Um, we have the, the Make the Great Shadow program. We bring people around to different places of business and they get an idea of how those businesses are run. Um, and then we have a, a, an ambulance. We're part of this team, the Save a Life Rescue Team, and we teach people CPR and we can we can really save actually save people's lives. We have and, a school that has the lights and the alarms in it and everything. And uh, and and you you see the kids grow or benefit from it over the period of time. Yes, in one of the videos that we uh, we did, we have this young lady who used to do our public service announcements uh, for us. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there was a, a camera person who shot it from BronxNet. Um, and that there's, person, there's your village, Bob. That's it. You're bringing all the resources you have. Yeah, that person was a child when they did it. And we, we showed in the, uh, the, the last uh, video that we did. And she, she, we showed the video. And then she came back and says, I can't believe that was me. But now I'm at Stanford University. And it just wow. made me. Oh, uh, that's it. This, right this is this is why we do it. And um, have you seen over the course of time, I mean, both of us have been doing what we do for a, a very long um uh, for a very long time, yeah. um, do you see a, um, a, a difference in the need from, let's say, when you started versus where we're at now? We know right now there's very difficult issues with our kids, with everybody. But do you see a general trend um, with with our kids as far as their needs? I think the needs are always going to be there. Um, there's always going to be that gap to be filled. Um, 
because the people just don't have what everybody else has. So you want to go into those schools. For instance, our other programs, we, we feed uh, parents and, and, and students who are having a rough time. We take them shopping. And, and in the beginning, I'm guessing you did not have to do that in 2004. But now food insecurity has heightened. It's pretty big, yeah. Uh, bigger now than before, of course. But it was probably always there. But now uh, with COVID-19, the pandemic, everything is like out in the open, you know. Um, so we do want to show you this. It's very short, but it is really this cute video. Now, so you go to different schools and the kids, the kids, and they represent themselves and they're happy to yeah. be part of and make the grade. All right. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Do we have a drum roll on my microphone? Here we, here we go. So here's uh, Dr. Bob Lee and uh, the kids of the Bronx and the kids of New York. Let's take a look. Who are we? The Learning Tree Cultural Preparatory School. We are the 7th graders of IS-180. We are the Urban Male and Female Leadership Program at Human College. Dr. Martin Luther King Community Choir. We make the grade at the Jewel of Long Island City. Here we go. Make the grade. Yeah, 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 Dr. Bob making the grade. Um, but, you know, this leads into something that um, I always like to ask people who do these kinds of things. What's your favorite thing? What do you love out of it? Is it those moments just being with the kids or, or you know, are there aspects of it that here's some, uh, uh, see what, what it looks like from yeah. from beginning to end. But really for you, Bob, what, you know, has, have you made the grade through this process? I mean, talk to me about yourself and what this has meant. I definitely have, you know, uh, throughout the years, you know, people have come up to you and say, hey, I remember you came to my school when I was wow. at school and, you know, I remember what you said to me, I, you inspired me and I, my mom was there and, you know, and, and we still live by some of the things that you've uh, mentioned. And that right there is like, wow. Yeah. And it happens often too. And, and that's like a, when you're passionate about something, it just comes full circle. And that right there is a circle of love. You know, I, I can relate to that because um, both of us do what we do um, because we love the work. I mean, it's it's good work. It's fun work. But there, there's doing it in the Bronx, doing it in the city, doing it on WBLS, there's a community aspect that if you're committed to it, that's really like, you know, there's always issues with your work. I was talking to somebody and I said, well, what's the payoff? And then he said, well, what'd you do today? I said, well, I did a really important program about, you know, numbers of COVID or how to, how to deal with, um, you know, uh, homelessness or whatever. I said, that's the reward. I think I really help people. That's it, right? That's what we do. Yeah. When you help people get enough, when you help them get what they need out of life, that's, that's what's important right there, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what we strive to do. You know, I, I got a list here that came, um, you know, through through your website, by the way. We'll put the website up there um, uh, for Make the Grade, MTG, if you will. Um, the shadow program, the college fairs, the college bus tours, taking kids to college. Let them see that this can be them, you know. Uh, the local school tours, the educational book series, Save a Life Rescue Vehicle. You know, there's a story in the in, in one of the papers, I think it was the Times or something, of like an eight-year-old kid who whose classmate was choking over something he had swallowed, and the kid did CPR or did the Heimlich maneuver because he he learned it from not in your case there, but that's the kind of thing you're teaching kids to do. Yes, yes, it's all it's all about education. You know, it's all about education. Um, food insecurity. I, I'm sorry. I got to read all of it. We want it, We this is. We want you to make the grade today on on the Bronx Buzz. Uh, food insecurity. We've got you covered. Blanket program. What is that about? Well, um, like when we have a very very cold winter. Oh, around giving out blankets to the homeless. Wow. And I tell you, there's a lot of people living in shelters who go to schools. So we give them. We go 
put a blanket on them and, and just uh, keep it moving. And, and, and you know, it, it makes a day, it makes a child think, you know, who's who's struggling to get on the subway and then they're going back to a place that's not even theirs. And it makes them feel loved and comforted. Uh, let's see, the MTG Communication Club, I would be more interested in that, considering yeah. it's what we do for a living. And the uh, community uh, ministry, um, getting into their souls. Do you... Do you recruit um, partners all the like? Is it a daily thing, or do you have a stable of partners now that you work with, or is it always dynamic and changing all the time? Well, we we add partners, but uh, yeah, you, you you can't one organization can't do it by himself by itself. You, so we include a lot of different partners. We are uh, it's all about helping others get what they need. So we you, you need partners in doing the things that you do. Now, you mentioned the communications program. What we did. Uh, in the beginning was go around to uh, elementary schools, junior highs and, uh, and high schools. And uh, we set up a program where kids were able to go out and get information and speak on the PA system. Oh, you, you, Bob, I mean, you know, this is where I live, man. I'm applauding that. that kids will learn and represent themselves. Listen, we're almost out of time. Make the grade MTG. Let's look, uh, look it up online. Um, I wanted to give you a chance to do this. At the end of Open Monday, every show, you say a thing. I don't remember what it is, but I thought to honor you and your great work at MTG, we're going to give you a chance to close the Bronx buzz with what Bob Lee does on Monday. They don't need to hear me say, I'll see you next week. So let's do it. Dr. Bob Lee, president and CEO of Make the Great, of course, WBLS, and Open Monday on BronxNet. Close the show. And it's also it's also on uh, make the grade.org. Make the make grade. the grade.org. We always say this. Hey, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Remember this, what you are is God's gift to you, and what you make of yourself is your gift to God. So choose your choice and let your choice control the chooser. And also remember, whether you say you can or you can't, either way, you're right. Of the doc Bob Lee. With Gary Axelvink. Yeah. Gary. <laughs> what, what what a treat. You know, you know it's gonna have the one thing you forgot, which I'm gonna say and you're gonna agree with. It's happy new year time. So happy new year. Let's let's be safe. Let's get vaccinated. Let's wear our masks. Let's love each other. Let's get blankets and hug each other. And that's how we'll do it in 2022. All right, Dr. Bob, what do you think? Yeah, I'm with you every time. <laughs> All right. A pleasure to have you uh, with us and uh, good luck uh, with continued success to make the grade. And guess what? We will see you next week. Happy new year. 